Do you believe in aliens? Uh, yes, I do. I nice. Do believe in aliens. Uh, yeah. Do you, do you believe in aliens? Yeah, I think it's kind of hard to... I personally think it's hard to believe there's nothing out there. It's so... We're such a tiny speck on the... We went into... The reason he asked this question is because we went into... We started talking all about, like, life, the universe, and all that. And, and um, yeah, like, I, I struggle to think that there's nothing. Not even because... Like, yeah, I don't know. I find it odd, just the idea that we would be the only thing that out yeah. there. Like, I just yeah, find that so 100%. impossible to believe. Um, Especially because we're such a small part of one the universe but you know also in comparison to the size of all the other planets we're like yeah pretty small aren't we well like and the sun isn't even that big is it compared to other stars and that is that right i think like the sun's not even a big yeah right yeah thing. exactly so there could i mean be we like... don't really know what's further than the universe it's just, it's just pretty it's pretty trippy it's it's one of those things you know when all the stars are out at night and you're with a few friends, you've had a couple beers or whatever. Maybe not two beers, maybe like five or ten or something. But then you look in the sky and you're just like, yeah, man, aliens are definitely real. <laughs> you look in the sky like, I need another beer. Um, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, I need another beer. And then we'll talk about aliens. <laughs> I remember um, yeah. during during lockdown, the first time it happened, um, I went home where my parents live in the middle of the Cotswolds, which is like just really lovely place very like middle of nowhere um and i'd quite often just at night i would just like maybe not just before i went to bed but like i would you know the weather was so nice it was so clear in like march it was like march through may sort of time and the it was so hot and sunny you know but then in the evening and the night at the night it would kind of clear out and the, the amount of stars I could see from outside, I'd literally just sit there with like a gin and tonic and just stare and just, that'd be like, wow. my chill out. Like it was really, it was a really weird, um, it was cool. Then you start thinking about stuff like, you know, when you see stars flickering mm. and then you're like, that star's probably not there anymore. It's, uh, it's died or something, right? Is that, is that correct? I don't. I know what you mean. There's some died or something. The different. Uh, why are we musicians trying to talk about astro? Yeah, I don't know. It just sounds <laughs> stupid, doesn't it? <laughs> it's probably, probably someone listening who has some vague understanding. Like, what are they on about? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I. What I did quite like doing is if you like have like a soft focus when you look up, and you can just in your peripheral vision you can just see like satellites just moving. Um, and again, where, oh. um, where my parents' house is, is like quite high, is quite high elevation. So like you're, you're not above the clouds or anything, but you're like, I think you're above a lot of the, basically it's very clear. Yeah. You can see like sort of haze of like the Milky Way in the sky and it's really cool oh, wow. on a clear night. That's Whereas here nice. where I live in Birmingham, you can just see the reflection of all the street lights in, in the sky and the cloudy sky. It's just <laughs> yeah, depressing. <exactly. clears throat> clouds. Um, where about, whereabouts do you live? Uh, I currently live in St Albans. Cool. Okay. Nice. Yeah, so that's like so, um, outside London, kind of what, North London. Yeah, right? just just north of London. Uh, but I'm from. Um, I grew up in Derby kind of area. It's not far it's from like, where I'm at. Yeah. Oh really? Okay. Uh, yeah. Cool. But I'm in yeah, Birmingham, so I guess yeah. not far is like you know. Yeah. Yeah. Midlands. Yeah. Yeah. It's all the it's all one big middle bit, isn't it? Yeah. Um, exactly. <laughs> what's this? There was something I was thinking about the other day with what's your. Um, perspective on so like i'm kind of considering where i want to base myself longer term you know um mm. in, in terms of building like a music career in some way mm. um do you think being closer to london or being based around london way is important for your sort of musical career and i don't just mean for the sake of like having a band near you or whatever yeah. i don't know where your where your bandmates are based but you know um i don't just mean for the sake of like being around your band but just for, like for the industry as a whole do you feel like being where you are is good for your career or do you think you could kind of do what you're doing sort of anywhere um, in the country it's it's interesting because when i was 18 i moved to london from derby kind of area um and actually i was from a, a town called ripley so it wasn't even anywhere near as big as Derby. It was even smaller than that. I know that's very cliche. Just a small town, boy. <laughs> you know, all that stuff. But, you know, um, so yeah, I'm, I moved to London when I was 18 because I just thought, you know what, I really want to give this this music thing a, a really good shot and the best shot that I can give it. And um, at 18, you don't really know much. So I just thought London is the, the place to go. 
but it really got me out of my comfort zone. Um, and it got me going out to like jam nights and networking with musicians and, you know, watching musicians play styles of music that I'd never, ever listened to before, never mind kind of thought of playing. So it did push me out of my comfort zone quite a lot, um, even to the point of the first meal I cooked myself when I moved away from home was white rice, like horrible boiled white rice, like I didn't clean the starch out of it, so it was all starchy, and then a bit of soy sauce and a plonk of black pudding on the top. Oh, that's like so... Bre- like breakfast, breakfast <laughs> black pudding. What? It was pretty grim. <laughs> that's... Yeah. I don't I don't know why I thought that was like a good idea. I was just like, you know, carbs, protein, got a bit of iron in there. It's like, yeah, that's a good balanced meal. <laughs> a bit of soy sauce for a bit of flavour. And I just took one bite and I was like... Oh, this is awful because my mum is an amazing cook. So I've always been used to like really nice food. So that was really pushing me out of my comfort zone. I was like, right, I got to learn to cook. I got to do this, this, and this. And, you know, so it's good in the sense that I think just in general, moving out of your hometown and kind of moving into a bigger city in general, I think is good for, you know, pushing yourself in music and, uh, you start to socialize with people. I was really bad at socializing growing up. And then all of a sudden when I'd kind of moved out of my hometown, I was forced to start, you know, using social skills. So I think you learn a lot of skills that you need in the music industry, you know, to um, work with other people. I don't know if you find the same thing, you know, in Birmingham as well. Yeah, there's quite a lot going on here. Like it's not I, I just remember being at a gig in London like back in December thinking like there's a lot going on here like there are a lot of people there that I thought like huh I I kind of need to be hanging around these people not in like a sort of uh, yeah. kind of climb the social ladder way just like I just thought huh this is where you know <clears throat> every now and again well quite often if I go to a metal gig in Birmingham I'll know a lot of the people there like the promoters and the yeah um, uh, you know some, there might be some artists and I bump in I quite often bump into people I know yeah. basically that are in the industry in some way or or other um and i guess maybe the thing with london is you then become small fish in a big pond don't you so i guess it maybe it's a double-edged sword because you don't want to just be like another number in the in in that sort of equation that is london but yeah i don't know i think longer term i could see myself moving that way you know just closer to london i was brought off in surrey so i have an affinity to that but it's really fucking expensive to live there (laughs) so um, right exactly that's the thing about london in general it's like everything just costs more um and i remember i used to live like in in london and i I moved between a different couple places you know i was renting and i'm still renting to be fair uh but then me and my girlfriend decided, okay, we want to be around London because during lockdown, I moved uh, back to the Midlands in Nottingham and it was actually so nice. It was the first time that I'd lived in like a reasonable sized place on my own, you know, it's like two bedrooms. So one of them was like the biggest one just became the studio, you know, and there was like all my amps were in there, my recording gear. And that's when I noticed, um, I really started to work hard on things and work hard on tracks. And I just, every day I was just like working on music because I had the space to do it. I was lucky enough to do that, you know? Um, But, you know, the price of rent in a place like that is like half, if not less, less than half of a place in London, you know? So, um, but I really got used to being kind of out the big, big city there. So, um, so yeah, when we decided to move back into the London area, it was like St. Albans seems like a nice mix. You've got that countryside. It's not crazy busy, but it's also 20 minutes on the train to get into London if you want to watch a gig or hang out with friends and stuff. So that seemed like a good balance, you know. So I'm not sure what it's like in Surrey as well. Is it a similar kind of thing? Uh, it's sort of. It's further out. Like So you're looking at about an hour to get into Waterloo, London Waterloo, or 50 okay, minutes. Yeah. So it depends where you I mean, it depends where in Surrey you are, but for me, it was about 50 minutes on the train. Um, but yeah, the it's interesting what you say about uh, your environment and like how that affects your creativity. Because I found <clears throat> when I 
where I used to live was just um, your standard thing where like you have your room in amongst and there were like six other people living there. And then there was yeah. the communal area and yeah, and I got on really well with everyone. Well, yeah, enough of the people I lived with. Um, right. When there's seven of you, you don't have to get with on with all of them, I guess. Um, yeah, of course. But it was, I felt, I felt so claustrophobic because my bed was like here and my desk was here and my guitars were there and I worked right. from my desk so I'd teach guitar and I would teach from there um, and I, I and like I, had, I only had like one or two in-person students because like it's weird just teaching out essentially my bedroom you know um, right right and now that I've actually got like my own place and this is like my living room you know I'd love it to be like a studio but you know I'm not exactly going to complain um, I feel so much more just free to do my thing um, I, can, I, can, I yeah I can see and I feel for people who maybe struggle to be creative where it's it's not even a it doesn't even relate to their creativity directly maybe it's just that they're not in the right place to be yeah the right creative. environment <clears throat> yeah and I, yeah. I think it's kind of working with what you've got and then just kind of building up steps i'm sure that you didn't just leap straight into you know having your studio in your living room you know um it's it's building those steps isn't it and then you kind of work with what you've got and then in the next place you might go right maybe i've got a little bit more work i can afford a little bit more space here my space is going to get bigger and bigger and then your creativity just starts flowing more i guess it depends yeah. what environment you like but yeah i never got um like my desk right here is right by i've drawn the curtain but it's literally it's a big open window well closed window it's really cold but you know what i mean big um, yeah <laughs> big window right in front of me because i need the sunlight and i need the the sort of daylight i'm not one of these i don't like these dark studios as cool and sort of like sci-fi as they can seem um my yeah. ideal like creative space would be like big glass doors you know um like really nice feel to it that's very open and very like out not outdoorsy but you know what i mean like exposed to sunlight and natural light that's a big thing for me and i, I don't i yeah. i find it really odd so the guy i just chatted to um he's a complete night owl and <clears throat> he works through the night and his studio i think um i suppose it doesn't matter where his studio is if it's dark outside but like, yeah <laughs> i can't i couldn't do that because i just i feel so like it feels like i'm kind of looking through this really narrow sort of lens i don't know how to put it um but it's interesting to talk about environment and creativity because i think there are you know like we we're saying there's so many people perhaps that are just un unfortunately not in an environment that works for them um and i also yeah. get envious sometimes when i see people that have earned every right to have you know these amazing studios and stuff you, sure, know, you, see, yeah. you see it all over instagram it's very aesthetically pleasing looking studios yeah, right. with all, the, <laughs> all the all the house plants and that and the, and the you know the minimalist decor and stuff and it's easy to get a bit envious of that because you're like oh, i wish i could just have that space but then part of me goes if i'm going to be creative i'm going to be creative and should probably not look for the right. excuse there as much as it helps you know um, yeah definitely do you ever and i think i think like almost um being creative will just get you closer to that goal anyway you know i feel like the people that have that space have probably been creative to earn that you know so it's, it's coming man we're gonna get it we're gonna get that massive studio I'll with all the, all the plants and uh, yeah go halves <laughs> <laughs> we'll achieve that yeah i am um, do you ever find yourself with uh if you're having like a creative rut or like a or if you're in a, 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 a sort of mental space where you're not feeling creative do you ever find yourself coming out with those excuses like oh but i've had a rubbish day or oh, i've had this um because i know for a fact sometimes i just have to tell myself just shut up and just just, just play the guitar you know like because sometimes right. there are cer certain things that you do have to you know if you're having a hard time with certain things you have to sit and you know process some of that stuff but sometimes i just find myself excusing it because like oh well i'm busy with this today so i can't yeah do it. right it's like do you ever find yourself doing that or are you good at just cracking on it's easy to make excuses isn't it um i do it all the time and i have to like check myself a lot you know i've always um i've always been like super hard on myself mentally from a, a young age um and i think that probably comes from even though my parents were really sportive uh, my mum is from the philippines she's got a very like strict kind of background so she applied that to me as well um so i've always kind of held myself responsible for things you know so uh, and that kind of bleeds into 
uh, creativity as well. So, so let's say I have a day where I just didn't achieve the things that I set out to achieve in my head. Uh, I'll either kind of be really, really hard on myself or just kind of try and make some excuses to kind of soften the blow a little bit like, oh, well, you know, it rained today, so I didn't get to the gym this morning, which meant that I was just thinking about that, so then I didn't write a song, and then, you know, you can just go on all day and make excuses. But I think ultimately you just have to be nice to yourself because otherwise the creativity won't happen in that, like, jackpot moment, you know, that song that you write or that solo that you nail or that lick that you play or whatever, you know, whatever it is, that might not happen, you know, if you're too hard on yourself. So I think it's just that perfect balance of being, you know, realistic and fair, but also being nice to yourself, you know. It's a hard balance, isn't it, I find. Do you find the same thing? Yeah, I yeah, totally. I I, I um I think I'm Sometimes I just get the worst of both worlds where I'm like, I'm harsh on myself and then take the time off and then I'll be nice to myself. Like, yeah, no, you needed that. <laughs> and it's like, I've just, yeah. I've just, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, it's a tricky, I, I almost try not to overthink it too much and just like, I've been trying to make myself, you know, those moments in life where you, you stop before you do something like, you know, like, uh, I've, anyone that listens to this podcast will probably be fed up with this by now but I've been I've started to do all these like cold showers and stuff and I feel like that's oh, okay it's something that I mean I don't talk about it all the time to be fair but I'm not one of those um you know just people that just sort of spout out the, the same what's it um <laughs> yeah. there's a few people that are culprits of that but um I found for me it's a bit of it is about just making myself do it like it's getting rid of that that like oh I don't want to do that kind of thing like if I'm feeling not feeling creative it's like it doesn't matter I'm just going to sit down and try and and um i'm trying to in my life do more of that like do more of the just stop thinking about it and just sit down and do it um you know things like my i've just got i've i just say to myself i've got to make sure i play every day even if i really don't have the time amongst like so i teach as well and you know if i don't have the time mm. um between that and maybe some podcasts or whatever just like general life stuff i need to do i yeah. always make sure to play something and it's, it's been benefiting me now because i just you know there'll be some days previously where maybe i wouldn't even pick it up just for the day because like i'm doing some you know it's not like it would be totally fair to not pick it up that day you know yeah um, yeah but I just pick it up even for like 10 minutes and just do something. And I think that habit of just picking it up, that means the day, the next day when I've got time, I pick it up and I sit for a lot longer and I actually like, whereas if I didn't pick it up the day before you, you, I think you fall off of that. You can fall off yeah, of that. Yeah, you fall um, off the bandwagon. Of yeah. Um, playing. And I find that routine yeah. really helps. Um, there's something, something I was intrigued to sort of ask you about. Cause um, I saw when I was doing the sort of deep dive of your uh, sort of, background your sort of musical background if you like um yeah. that you started from quite a young age from playing right um and that's right yeah yeah is that so i found um i remember i think i got my first guitar when i was about 10 something like that but i played for maybe a year and a half two years or something and i think i got quite good in the time but i for what you know when you're young you just drop stuff you just lose inch if it's not like immediately grabbing mm. you so i kind of stopped playing around the age i think about 13 and then okay. i picked it up again when i was about 18 um and obviously felt like oh shit i've got to catch up now um but <laughs> the the question is if you uh through playing from such a young age have you ever had those moments where um that passion has gone or do, do you ever feel like you might have benefited from putting it down for a small amount of time uh, uh, sort of as you were growing yeah. up. I definitely, I can relate to the, the second part of that where it's, I've benefited from putting it down. Uh, but that was, it was definitely in the later years. So the more recent years of playing, um, <clears throat> because actually it, it's a weird one, but as soon as I start playing guitar, I just couldn't think about anything else. I was just like so obsessed with guitar. It's literally all I was good at, you know. Uh, I've tried really hard to be good at football because when you go to, like, I don't know if you know any Americans listen to this um, podcast, but in the UK, if you play what you guys would call soccer or whatever, like no, we'll call it football here. It's fine. 
<laughs> yeah, we'll call it football here. <laughs> they can adjust. But if you play if you play football in the UK, it's like you're Mr. Popular, get all the girls. Like, you know, you tick all these boxes in school. So I was always like, yeah, I want to play football. And then I just wasn't good at it. Start going to these football after school clubs. Still wasn't good at it. And I was like, man, I want one of those trophies. What well, that kid's got a little trophy. I want one of those things, you know, for trying hard or whatever. So anyway, I just was so rubbish at it. And I remember once I was going on, um, I was going on holiday and just before we're about to leave for the airport, I was like, I'm just going to go in the garden, just try that trick one more time. I was so rubbish at football. I don't know why I was trying so hard. And, and I just stood on the ball wrong and I slipped and banged my head. And that was the end of it. I was like, never playing football again. I hate football. Like, I was just honestly so bad at football. So that's what got me into playing music. I mean, I was always kind of gravitating towards certain albums. But, um, but I started playing music then. And I just never stopped since because I was so obsessed with it. And I was like, yes, this is something that I'm good at. And, you know, I love it. And YouTube and the Total Guitar app on my iPod Touch, you know, with Zach Wilde on it. I was just like, this is awesome. I'm loving this, you know, I found my thing. So I pretty much through through nine to like 18, the only times I would stop playing is if I would go on holiday um, and in the later years, I just started taking my guitar with me on holiday anyway. So I was, I was just so obsessed with it. Um, but yeah, definitely more recently, um, if I stop playing guitar for like two weeks and I come back, I won't notice that difference that I used to notice when I was younger, when I stopped playing for two weeks, it was like, I'd forgotten how to play. Whereas now I take two weeks off and it's almost like, oh, all of a sudden, I like the sound of my own licks again. I was just hearing them too much, you know. Your ears get fatigued with your own sounds. I don't know if you find the same thing when you play, you know, the same licks over and over again. Naturally, because that's what we do as humans, uh, you start to get fatigued with them. That's why we chase new licks, you know. Mm, yeah, I, I I find that I'm, I'm always more drawn to, like, um, the kind of songwriting side of things than the lead stuff but again the same thing happens you write that riff and it's like oh wrote that last week you know um yeah like, right i'm always trying to mess around with uh different little nuances things like um i really love like heavy metal like kind of modern metal stuff um so i'm always trying to mess around with like different placements of things like palm muting or like um cool. it's a really hard thing to consciously do i realize there are so many patterns like you just pick any metallica song ever and like that's the kind of palm muting like rhythmic pattern that seems to have carried through a lot of modern metal um yeah right. take your master of puppets or like blackened or songs like that um where you hear the muted low string and the unmuted high one and you get these sort of jumps in this quite in interesting rhythmic thing going on um uh, and, and i've been trying to mess with that stuff but yeah it is very like uh I definitely find it easy to get stuck and I'm always just, I find I rarely ever play like a pure power chord now. I'm always like, what can I add on top? Or like, what can I... Right, yeah, do, some flavours. Yeah, and I'm sometimes like, I do just need to hit a power chord or I do just need to hit a low string because that's kind of what it wants. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's a weird kind that's of balance, cool. um, like balance to find. I just found this weird bit of hair is jumping all over the place. <laughs> What's that all about? Talking about balance. Yeah, my hair. Yeah, balance my hair. In, in my me. wax in my hair. <laughs> Checking myself out. I'm obviously. Uh, I always find that um, with song with songwriting, uh, for me, I, I, I quite often gravitate towards the same pre-chorus. That really annoys me. Like it takes yeah. me the most time with pre-choruses. Um, I just naturally want to just go to C to D and then we're back in E, you know? So I don't know. It's just, yeah. uh, that's, that's one that always bugs me. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just what you're used to. We're just human at the end of the day. Hmm. Yeah. I, um, I, I find there's certain, um, I have these little, I have, uh, like an aversion to certain things in, uh, in, in songwriting that I just feel like I've heard too much. I don't know if you're the same, but like there are certain, um, I can play it in my own play and go, no, not doing that. No, 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 not playing that. Like, you know, there'll be a thing like if the resolution, if the chord resolution is too strong, if it mm. sounds a bit too four chord songy, I'm immediately just like, no, I'm not doing that. Same with when I write riffs. I, 
I have a reluctance just just to chug the low string, even if maybe it's kind of what it wants in the moment. Because I'm like, no, it's just there's just so much of that nowadays. In that yeah, kind of right. Um, it's yeah, it's almost like a disease in in, in us, isn't it? Because we've yeah. been exposed to so much music that I feel not to bash on '80s stuff. Oh, I love '80s music, and I love that style and that genre. Um, but I, I feel like for me, certainly when I write certain things, if it's at, if it leans too much towards something or too much towards an era that maybe has been done so much, I'll, I'll kind of pull it back and be like, ah, it just just sounds cheesy. You know, it sounds cheesy. It sounds done. So I guess it's the same with what you're saying. It's like, if you feel like something's been done over and over again, uh, it's, you don't necessarily want to include that you want to change it up and spice it up in a different way uh, but it's interesting because to some people it won't be cheesy yeah so with obviously your kind of your sort of music definitely has some of the old school influences in there um uh what do you think maybe are there things that maybe guitarists nowadays are neglecting some of the you know people joke about like the boomer bends and stuff right but like right, right. um do you think there are things like lessons out there from some of the classics that people are starting to maybe neglect in the songwriting and in just like lead guitar playing and all of that yeah i mean i think something that i've always noticed um about like lead playing in general is uh, vibrato um, and I, I feel like it's kind of coming back as well, though, because I, I see a lot of players with amazing vibrato as well. But definitely maybe um, three years ago-ish, two, three years ago, you'd kind of scroll through YouTube or Instagram. And of course, there's always going to be like amazing players. There's endless amounts of ridiculous players out there. But also, I would notice that people put a lot of time into everything else like tapping or arpeggios and sweeping and all these like crazy techniques, but then they kind of neglect vibrato. Um, and that's one of the, the main things for me that I listen to when it comes to players, you know, that's like the make or break. And I grew up on players like Zach Wilde and Slash and Malmsteen and those kind of guys with like super intense vibrato. Um, so yeah, that's definitely the main thing for me. Uh, especially Zach Wilde. I saw him live not long ago. And uh, people bash on him a lot because of his EMGs and he's got a lot of gain and stuff. And I don't know when it became cool for people to just bash on Zach Wilde. It's so weird. He was like such a hero to everyone for ages. And then everyone just thought it was really cool to start like, you know, bashing on his tone and taking the piss out of EMGs. But um, but anyway, I saw him. I saw him play with Black Label Society and I've always loved Zach, so I was like really looking forward to it. And man, I was near the front and my face just got absolutely melted. I felt like a little kid at the show. I felt like I'd discovered guitar all over again. It was amazing. And um, his other guitar player, I think his name's Dario. I think I'm so, I'm yeah. sure it's Dario. Yeah. He is like just as good as Zach. Together they're like absolute monsters and they were doing like some behind the neck stuff and it was just honestly mental like some of the best guitar playing i've ever seen and i I had like a big turning point there it wasn't even that long ago where i was kind of like oh man that's just the kind of lead playing that i love and it physically like makes my blood boil when i'm sat there it's like oh yes this is awesome so um i just said to myself like i I just want to play how I want to play and it you know there's always that thing in the back of your head of oh maybe Instagram will like this or you know everyone's doing this and this is cool and this is cool but I think um you should just do what you want you should just play how you want and you should play the way that you like you know play I'm trying to explain it properly here but play how you want to listen to people you know, that should be the goal because then you'll just be happy with your playing and, you know, you'll be happy in music. Yeah. Otherwise you're just a slave to social media and the latest trend and all that stuff, you know? Yeah. I, um, 
it's a, it's a weird uh, some people it's funny some people are more uh like receptive to trends and quite i think quite enjoy picking up on that stuff i am um, i i was i used to be very like trends no and and i still kind mm. of am but like i think sometimes you know some some people just love hopping on the latest trend and making a yeah, guitar video enough. and i'm like yeah it's cool i mean i'm not really um it's not where I w- would lean for my own. I, I'm more in your camp, I think. Um, out of interest, which yeah. Black Label Society gig did you go to? Where it was uh, at Electric Ballroom in Camden. Oh, because I went. To, I saw them at the Albert Hall quite a few years back. Oh, oh right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I remember that. I remember when they came to town and did that, but I, I didn't go. I was yeah. good that I didn't. It was That's quite, cool. It was cool. I remember one. It was the oddest thing because I a friend of mine who is not he he does not like heavy metal music. He's quite an open minded person, but he's not into heavy metal. Um, yeah. And I said I was going to London to see this gig, and he's like, "Can I come?" I'm like, uh, if you want. Like, I don't know if you'll like it. And I don't think he really liked it because it was a bit of a shred fest. And if you're not a guitar player, yeah. like, it's a right. bit. I, you can like the music, no, but there's some cool moments. I think even as a non, even if you weren't a fan, that you'd be like, oh, that was fun. But yeah, yeah. Sure. Had I brought him to maybe like a, a Slipknot show where there's more going on in the crowd and like that right, might be exactly. a different thing. You might, have, but I don't think I did say to him. I was like, I kind of feel a bit bad that you've come to a gig that isn't really. I think you've got to want to be there for that sort of one. As most as great as Zach is, you know, if you don't really know who Zach right. is, it's like. I um, guess it's a slightly, uh, a slightly more niche audience then like you say metal, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's cool though yeah it was it was i mean i admire his openness to to just go like um that's the kind of thing i just think is great in like friends you know just having people that are open to to doing that kind of stuff you know just rock up to a metal Definitely. gig and just be like yeah why not like i try it's kind of like watching that. a real life reaction video yeah sort of when you he, bring a friend to a gig it's kind of like oh what did they think? Do they think the same as I do about this song? This song is awesome. Or saying to your friend, like, wait for this bit, wait for this bit, right now, right now, right now. And I do that with like actual uh, recordings as well. When you get a friend round, you're just like, this bit, this bit here, this bit here. And when you can get those kind of friends together, that's like, you know, when you shine, I think it's like, you're all in the same boat. Yeah, I I, am. The worst thing is when you're showing someone something and they either just don't really get it or they'll like talk over the bit. You're like, no, no, that bit. And then they talk again. You're like, no, that bit. And, you know, like that pinch harmonic there, that's the one. That's the the thing. That's the worst. Uh, The talking over the bits is like, oh, no. Or or they'll be signing through the whole song and they're talking over the solo and it's like, we're going to have to rewind that. I'm sorry. We're going to have to go back. Go back. (laughs) Yeah. I've had had, like conversations and sorry, my phone's going off. Let me just stop that right i've had yeah i've had like conversations in um uh like if i'm ever in like a more like rock like bar or something and then a really good song comes on and i feel bad because i'm just like half in the conversation and i'm half like listening to right. Sui by system of a down or something you know whatever's come on that's like i've gone oh i really like this song <laughs> um, yeah. i feel like that's the musician's brain isn't it you're just you're listening to it breaking it down trying to figure out how to play it mm. but also if someone's pouring their heart out to you like talking about some deep conversation and you're just like uh, yeah i feel yeah that's that's really that's really that sucks yeah i'm sorry to hear that and you just break it down this song in the back of your head <laughs> i've been there a few times yeah. for sure what's um what are some of the good like hangout spots in london for if you want to go to do you know many of the um, places i think i know a few names but i wouldn't be able to um yeah call them um, out one a place that I, I used to hang out all the time. Still, I still do whenever I can. Um, so when you're going to get I a creepy fan to this... up. <laughs> <laughs> I have some stories, but I I have to tell you outside that's, of this. That's fine. That's all good. <laughs> um, but anyway, so yeah, uh, we we used to hang out at this place. So me and um, the other guitar player in Inglorious, Dan. Um, and and uh, Nathan, the singer, uh, whenever he was in town, we'd all hang out at this place called uh, Metalworks in in Camden. I don't know if you've heard of it before, but think, it's basically so. like a rock metal night. And it's a lot of people from the rock and metal scene kind of hang out there, but also they get up and play. And it's not your average jam night. They've got JCM 800 stacks and 
they're on like nearly 10. It's, it's honestly one of the loudest gigs that you can go to. And it's, it used to be in a tiny pub called The Monarch in Camden. Um, and that used to be a really cool vibe. And now it's in The Underworld okay. in Camden. Yeah, so every now and again on a Sunday, it's not as regular as it used to be. But um, yeah, it's good fun. And, and I actually learned a lot of stuff there just by getting up every week and learning new like uh, songs like Judas Priest songs and uh, Black Sabbath songs and uh, Iron Maiden songs and stuff like that. And kind of learning songs that I wouldn't have outside of that circle. Uh, but also you hear a lot of great players as well and their rendition of things. So you kind of pick pick little things out about their playing and like, yeah, that's cool. I might kind of take that into my playing or he does something cool there. And you kind of learn from other players, right? So that was a really cool place to hang out and I spent a lot of time there. Um, but also I used to like, uh, it was really gritty that place, but it was called Crowbar. Do you remember Crowbar? I mean, I've not spent much time hanging around in London, so like, th- I know a lot of yeah. names, but I actually I couldn't tell you what the places are like, you know. Yeah, so Crowbar was, um, I think it was next to a place called the Borderline. Again, no. You've heard of that? <laughs> yeah, so I know Bonamassa has done a few gigs there, like on DVD. It's like a tiny little club, and there's a tiny little bar next door called Crowbar, um, and it, it was a cool place. It was really gritty. Um, and, uh, yeah, dirty and stuff like that. But it was, it was cool because you could just go there with a few mates and that's part of the vibe and they just blast, you know, metal music and rock music. So yeah, they're a cool, uh, that was a cool place to hang out, but unfortunately it's not there anymore. But to be honest, I don't really go out and, uh, party that much. I know that's not very rock and roll, but I kind of, my ideal night in is either, chilling chilling out with my girlfriend or sitting on call of duty with my mates <laughs> yeah yeah I, to um, be honest <laughs> yeah I, I i kind of um i like a mix i like so tonight fun, funnily enough i will be in london tonight it's a cool um event that i'm going to oh a friend, but, cool um so i will be doing this podcast and i've got another one i'm doing three today it's pretty busy wow and then nice, uh, man. And then I will see so your two of three for today. I did two nice. yesterday as well. It's going to be five in 24 wow. hours. It's a lot of, it's the most I've ever wow. done. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, and then, yeah, then I'm going to this uh, big party with Canary Wharfway um, in, cool. uh, later today. So um, if you see That's a nice past, area, Canary Wharf. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, I've never actually yeah. been. Um, I've forgotten the name of the place now that where it's at. But if you see me passed out, somewhere on the floor <laughs> just, just give me a prod. <laughs> just give me a prod and make sure i'm all right and I'm, i'll probably be fine. yeah um but, <laughs> cool. so um with your kind of like you know we talk about like sort of developing your playing as like a sort of young person and still be how, how old are you now uh i'm 23 i always oh, have to think about that because we lost a few years to covid yeah. and i'm always yeah. like i'm a 22 23 24 I'm 23. I yeah. believe I'm 23. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, because I'm, so I'm 25, so I'm in a similar-ish boat to you, I guess. But um, yeah. what have you found is, your experience has been of, you know, playing some of these bigger shows and stuff and being around maybe guys that have been in the industry a bit longer, um, you know, older, mm. older folks. Uh, have you found that you've been treated differently for better or worse as like a younger person in um, a band that's doing pretty well? Yeah, it's 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 that's a really interesting, interesting question and a good question. Um, I don't often think about age at all. Like, I mean, even when you asked me then, and I still get it all the time. The only reason I, I knew exactly how old I was is because a few people have asked me more recently. If I hadn't, I would have been like, I, I'm either 22, 23, 24. I always do the same thing. Like, I, I always forget. And I just don't think about it that much at all. Um, but... Um, yeah, I think maybe before I was 18, I mean, before, before I was 18, I used to play in a, um, a band with, uh, some friends that I knew in school and we played a lot of places around the Midlands and we would gig every weekend, you know, from like Friday to Sunday, some weekends and some weekends it was more like, you know, just one day on the weekend. But, um, before I was 18, we'd done around 250 gigs before I'd even left home. So we, we gigged a lot. Uh, and 
I definitely found at, at that point people would treat you different for, for your age because they just think you're, you're just a kid. And I think as well, they, they see if you're young and you've got a Gibson Les Paul or a Marshall or something, they don't think, oh, he's done loads of gigs and put all of his pub money aside and brought himself that gear, you know, while he's living at home. They don't think like that. They just think, oh, daddy's money or right, stuff like that. So you get treated a bit different because of that. So that was slightly annoying. Um, but in terms of stuff like uh, from 18 and above, like being professional, um, no, I haven't noticed a lot of kind of ageism, um, but maybe I've just not kind of acknowledged it. Maybe it's there and I just don't acknowledge it. But, but to be honest, uh, most people are pretty cool. And I feel like the people that are really good at what they do and have been in the industry for a long time, they're not insecure. So they don't kind of try and put their insecurities on other people or pick on people or like, you know, um, like you're saying, treat people differently for how, how old they are. So yeah, that's something that I've always noticed in, in general. The, the good ones, the people that are really good at what they do, quite often they're nice people as well. And that's how they've lasted in this industry as well, right? And I feel like it's the people that, well, it's not everyone, but it's often people that are really insecure and maybe not sure about how good they are that are the opposite of that, you know? Did yeah. you say you've you noticed similar things? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I remember that the bands that, uh, with my old band, some of the bands we played with, the ones that were the most uh, pretentious and like thinking they f- probably knowing that they haven't got as far as they want to, but acting like they mm. have, um, they were always weirdly the ones that were like, it was, it, the irony was like the more successful the band, the less they had to tell me about it, you know, um, like right. I've met quite a few people from, on through the podcast or just through various you know things where like they never feel the need to tell me uh you know even through quite lengthy conversations before or after a podcast or a gig or whatever they never feel the need to tell me how many people they played in front of last week right whereas right. like i distinctly remember i'm not going to name names but i remember being at a gig not really that long ago and these uh so I I, ha- I I don't know if I still have it, but I had an endorsement with Victory Amps, um, and I'm not in the band, so I'm not in the band anymore. So I haven't really spoken to mm. them for quite a while, obviously. Yeah. Um, and I remember um, a couple of the people there were they clearly didn't think I'd really done an awful lot as a musician, and were sort of talking right. to me as if like you know as if they were imparting some special advice that i'd never heard before and i was a bit like, oh, there's a lot of those kind of people yeah around, and especially I was, at gigs and they kind of hang out at those places to do yeah. that it's so annoying no they were playing the gig they were playing the gig. oh they were playing that okay, was, okay that, this okay, is why okay. i'm not saying but they um and i was just, oh, just kind of thinking about just like like they weren't unpleasant but i was just like oh, come on yeah and um and they very quickly told me about oh well when i got endorsed by by them i'm like did you need to tell me that? Like, I don't, it doesn't change yeah, anything right. here. Like we're in the same room, you know, like, um, and I, I found that a bit tiresome and I, I've had a few people, <laughs> the, the, the weirdest one I've had, speaking of age difference, there was a, um, I, this is the weirdest, I, I, I've, the weirdest gig I've ever played was, um, again, I won't say who the band is, but they're not a big band, but like there was, it, there was a group of them. There were about nine of them or something. It was a big band. And their manager um, was like an older bloke. Um, it was mainly women in... I think it was entirely... I think it was mainly women in the band. I can't remember if that was it. Okay. Um, but anyway, basically, th- there's this older bloke that managed them. I think he must have been like late 50s, early 60s. Um, right. And he clearly thought he was the shit, like thought he knew about the industry and that. And I think he maybe played some gigs or done some cool stuff. Right, right. In his heyday, I don't know, like, um, and <laughs> one of those. <laughs> yeah, and we were stood in the audience watching his kind of band, um, and literally just having a really normal conversation in between songs, and then out of nowhere, he just says to me, "Yeah, so we all live together and like practice um, 
like we worship the occult and practice like group sex and all this stuff and I'm like what <laughs> he just threw it in wow. the conversation and I was just like this is this is not the normal band management scenario that I wow and I remember yeah. it was so weird and he was telling me about like all of these he was he was a bit like that where he was telling me about his experience in the industry I was like okay like I'm half interested it sounds a bit he's kind of, and then he just threw that in I'm like what like oh, worshiping the days. occult and all sorts of weird sort of ongoings in there. What did he? What did he want out of telling you that? Though? I was don't. It well, factor that's... or did he want you to think, ah, oh, this this old dude? I... Nothing. Nothing wrong with that. But uh, this no, old like... dude sleeps, sleeps with like nine women in the band at I... a time. Like, is that what he's trying to get out of something? Like, was he trying to get no a idea ego what... kick or so weird? I've no idea what his message was. It was just very, yeah. And it was just so, uh, he said it so candidly, like as if he just told me like, I'm soft for a drink, you know? Um, like, oh, cool. Nice. Wow. Glad I know that now. Some people <laughs> need to need to chill out. Yeah. It's like we were saying earlier, your ideal night uh, night out is a night in on Call of Duty. <laughs> yeah. Like this guy needs some Call of Duty. He needs to just wind it a back a little in. bit. Or maybe... <laughs> Sounds like he's had plenty of nights in. Anyway, um, <laughs> moving yes. on. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Move, I just thought I had to share that. I realised this just made me laugh. Um, yeah, the um, it's it's kind of a speaking of kind of I was going to say speaking of sort of um, candidly, but I was, I was trying to segue this neatly. It's not happening. Um, mm. But you talked earlier about like some putting some of your sort of content online and stuff, and I've seen sort of more recently you putting out a few more videos of your playing and like it. Um, right. I noticed some some of the stuff seems. Um, more candid and more in in the moment kind of playing. Um, I don't know if that's what it is. Maybe it's certain. Sometimes it comes right. across that way. Um, but do you, when you're thinking about what you want to put out online, is it something that kind of stresses you out? And you think, oh, I've got to put this out and I've got to do this, or is um, it something you just use as a bit of a like sort of poster board for what you're doing at the moment? It used to definitely uh, stress me out because I think most musicians that I've spoken to have that same thing of when they start maybe recording into Logic for the first time or like whatever DAW you have or you start filming yourself for the first time, you get that kind of stage fright all over again, you know. Um, and it's just because it's a new thing. And I used, to, I used to feel so anxious about it that I would like imagine certain, certain musicians that might follow me or certain uh, friends. I used to imagine like them saying bad things in my head before it's even out there as it's filming. Don't know why, but I guess you just get anxious about certain things. Right. Um, so I used to, I used to feel quite anxious about filming and recording myself. And I kind of got over that by being like taking a more chilled out approach to it, but also just spending like 10, 20 minutes before you start filming being like, okay, what am I going to do when I hit record? Because, you know, I've spent a lot of time previously just hit and record and you're just there for like over an hour, two hours, you know, you name it, whatever. And you're just not getting anywhere because you're just improvising constantly, constantly, constantly thinking, okay, I'm going to get this one magical moment at some point. So I kind of took a more relaxed approach to it and I was like, okay, um, what the things that I want to post on my Instagram are just kind of a reflection of what I want to be represented as like just kind of a guy that plays shreddy little licks here and there, because that's what makes me happy. You know, that's, that's what I'm into. So, um, so yeah, I just started planning out these tiny little videos around kind of 10 seconds long being like, okay, here's a quick little lick. And I'd plan it out before I hit record, just be like, okay, this, roughly what the lick is going to sound like. And then I would hit record and play from there. And I noticed a big leap in change in my um, approach to social media because I was like, all of a sudden I, I really don't mind it because it's feeling easier. There's less pressure on me um, to post, but also it's, it's easier. I can just wrap it up nice and quick. Um, so I noticed ever since I started doing that, I started posting a little bit more, which kind of helps your algorithms and stuff like that. So 
I just felt a lot more free for doing so. It wasn't like I'm a slave to social media anymore. It was kind of like, it's there. And sometimes I like to check out some amazing players that are on Instagram and YouTube right now, you know. So I like to use it to find inspiration, but also upload my own little videos sometimes. So, um, so yeah, I forgot. I forgot now. I've rambled so long. What the initial ending? It of was kind. Of, yeah, was. it was to do with your sort of what your approach is. Yeah, no, I think I think you sort of answered the. I, I'm more. Fo- I'm more tracking what you're saying in real time. So I've, I can't remember what I asked yeah. exactly, but yeah, no, I think that was roughly what we're talking about. But cool. Um, yeah, the, the I, I find what I want to start trying to make myself do is just put more videos out um, of me just playing. Try and do like one or two a week, just so that there's no pressure. Just because. I've not put anything on my Instagram for ages, like with me playing for like a long time. Um, so I want to just start putting ideas and just like creative ideas. Cause then you get over that kind of stage fright of like, Oh, what are people going to think of that? Cause if it's crap, it's like, it's fine in three days, I'll put another one up and, and there'll probably right. be someone that likes like the, even if it's not that great, there might be someone that, yeah. And I'm sure know. it will be good. It's just a case of, um, yeah, you've not heard me whether, you, whether you <laughs> find it good, you know, whether you like that and you're proud of that. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, hopefully that's a a good kind of thing. I mean, so um, there's two there's two more things I wanted to touch on before we kind of finish up. The um, I know you've got a JTC course um, sort of coming up. What, what's been your rather than asking the generic questions about what's it like? What's the process of recording it like? I mean, what um, what do you feel like you've learned about your kind of yourself and your playing through? I guess through teaching as a whole, like um, maybe mm. not just teaching for like a course, but just through sort of education, what have you picked up about about your own processes and your own mindset and stuff through kind of talking with other people about it? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And I'm sure you, you know as well as a guitar teacher that when you're teaching other people, you start to realize more about your own playing and your own approach to things. Uh, and when I was first starting out, I felt a lot of pressure to teach like the standard, you know, the industry standard guitar teacher where it's like, you know, you do rock school grades and all that stuff, right? Which is fine, which is great. Um, but then I started to realize that you should be sharing insight of how you visualize the instrument as well, because at the end of the day, that's how you got to where you were with the instrument. So maybe it will help other people as well. And I find a lot of people um, really like the approach of not just theory, but shapes because I didn't, I didn't learn theory growing up. It was kind of later on that I learned modes and how to put things together and get kind of um, modal sounds out of the guitar. Right. So um, yeah, it's, it's for me, I visualize the guitar on shape. And I memorize these little shapes and I'll be like, that's a block, that's a block, and that's a block. Kind of like you do with pentatonic and then you do with the next scale and the next scale and the next scale. Just put them all together like a jigsaw piece. Um, So that's how I visualize guitar for years and years and still do primarily. And I find that a lot of people really like that approach because not everyone can be doing the maths really fast in their head of like theory, you know, so... I really like to take the approach of shapes, but then also notice certain sounds to be maybe this mode or this mode, and it's um, appropriate for this kind of track or this kind of part of the track. You know, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to you, right? Yeah, yeah, I definitely. Um, I'm I'm always conscious of trying to think about how I try to be as on like as uh, responsive as I can where and I try and get the student to lead the lesson as best as I can and that's not mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's two ways one because they then guide their own it kind of puts the emphasis on them actually putting the time in and guiding their own process right, yeah. but then also from a practical standpoint if I'm trying to prepare a new song for every student every time um, it's like it becomes impossible to try and manage and actually I found the best way when I first started right. teaching sometimes I'd be a bit out of my depth where like I'd rock up and and my intention would be, right, I'm just going to sit and work with whatever the student's got. And then if they hadn't done much that week, I'd be like, uh, oh, God, what are we doing today then? Um, whereas now, like, I've done it enough where if a student turns up, you know, whether I've taught them for a long time or not, um, a quick two-minute catch-up and I'll be like, okay, I know where you're at. I know what we could do, you know. Um, and I think I've got quite good at, like, figuring out what what's next, 
on the spot you know just knowing yeah and then I think that's then helped me in my playing because then I can be quite responsive to what I think I need to do in an immediate you know quite an immediate sort of fashion um it's pretty so cool yeah and I and it just I, it sounds lazy it's not like me just saying oh, I just don't prepare like I do I do think about what I'm going to do in the lessons but I like to think it's the whole point is I need to be responding to what they're immediately doing and the more I prepare in advance I've had it as well where I've like I've prepared a load of stuff in advance then we rock up and they've just done something totally different that week you're like oh cool I guess I'll just we won't do any of that then which is fine right, but it's just exactly. like well then I've just uh, just kind of wasted my time haven't I not wasted but you know could have spent it doing something else and yeah but I feel like I've definitely learned about communication and stuff um like like certain things that I think are obvious and then actually I'm like hang on a minute I've been doing this for a long time and I've been teaching it as well so I've seen like not only have I seen myself do it but I've then seen the process of other people learning it so yeah it's mm -hmm. a weird one to pick up um but in terms of um so we talked about your growth as a musician nearly knocked my water over that's good um <laughs> you can see my hand kind of went like that and nearly yeah um uh in terms of the future for your career what do you what sort of plans do you have like where would you like to see yourself going to and how do you think your mindset might look in the next kind of five ten years you know longer term um career yeah it's, it's interesting because um because yeah over the last few years it's been like really invested into the inglorious stuff uh, i joined a bit later in that band as well but it you know we've we've put out some really good records we're on break at the moment but um a lot of my time and effort has been all about that band of writing songs and um doing albums with them and now um i've had a little bit of a phase where it's kind of like we're working on the jtc stuff and you know the social media stuff and kind of my own playing but also uh, i've been working on uh with a couple a couple guys on a new band as well, which is going to be a very different sound to Inglorious. It's going to be a lot heavier. So cool. I know you you might uh, be interested in in some of that music as well, which Definitely. would be cool. Is this the inside um, scoop or have you, have you um, uh, how secret, no, how not, top secret is this? I've, I've not officially announced anything yet. So it's more for people to kind of keep their, keep their eyes out for this yeah. uh, in the next few months. Uh, but yeah, we've been recording. We've had a couple recording sessions already down in the studio. I sound so cliche that down in the studio. <laughs> back, back to the studio. Yep. Exactly. So yeah, we've been recording um, and it's it's very much kind of modern, modern sounding, but also it's got a few nods to the kind of the Linkin Parks and the Corns and the Slipknots and stuff like that. So it's going to be really fun, but there's going to be some surprises in there as well that people won't expect. Uh, but yeah, just keep an eye out. I mean, uh, we've been really enjoying the process and it's going to be a lot heavier and something completely different to what I've done before. So in terms of the future, uh, that's really what I'm working on right now, just kind of songwriting and just making music with some friends and uh, yeah, going from there. Wicked, yeah, that's exciting. I'm excited to hear it. I'll have to pest you yeah. about that in, in, in the coming. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We should that's we cool. should definitely um, we should get coffee or a beer sometime as well. Yeah. If well, when I'm, uh, I know you're around tonight, but yeah, well, when I've, you're around I'm, and not busy, it, it's like, hey man, I saw you, out and I'll just fall in the. <laughs> <laughs> um, Always welcome. Always yeah. welcome. No, that yeah, that'd be wicked, man. I, I I'm I'm in London semi regularly with music and just generally seeing friends. A lot of my friends are that way now. So yeah, that'd be awesome. I, I um it's really nice. I've had a few opportunities now to meet people. Um I mean some people I've had on the podcast have actually met before, so it's like the other way around. But um yeah. had a few people that I've met even from the States and stuff, which is cool whether over here and nice. um, you know, getting invited to gigs and stuff, which is cool. So yeah, no for sure. That's I'll um, cool. I will let you know, like I said, I'll I I haven't so I've been quite I think in January I've had all of like three beers probably if that and then I suspect tonight I might have more than I'll probably double my beer count for January tonight I would imagine nice so, <laughs> we'll see you earned it man you earned it man one so. each podcast yeah exactly yeah, yeah I think so. um cool so if you want to we need a question for the next guest um and an artist that you'd like to kind of share with the world um okay uh, question for the next guest. Which is in precisely one hour and 47 minutes time. Okay. Uh, 
what is the most embarrassing thing that you have ever done ever ever done ever with the not just not just on stage not just like you know in the studio or whatever what's the most embarrassing thing that you've ever had to do hopefully that will yeah i'm gonna put the extra ever on the end just to make sure yeah ever ever ever, ever. ever. exactly (laughs) Uh, uh so that's my question and a band that i've been listening to loads recently um are called lost society from finland cool. and they're they're really cool they're heavy they've got amazing guitar solos amazing vocals amazing everything really it's just one of those bands that i've been listening to a lot and it's just like ticks all the boxes for me so yeah definitely check those guys out nice wicked awesome if you well uh, just to finish up is there anything you want to sort of promote plug to the world uh yeah keep an eye out for the new JTC guitar course is going to be very much tailored around kind of hard rock licks, but there's also going to be kind of a bit of everything in there as well in terms of uh, difficulty. So there's going to be stuff in there that is maybe on the higher end of difficulty, but also stuff in there in the kind of medium and low end of difficulty as well. So it's a it's a very much like a all rounder hard rock masterclass kind of thing. So. I'm really looking forward to putting that out and seeing what people think. And also, yeah, keep an eye out for uh, a new band in the next few months and uh, some new music that we've been working on. Excited, man. I'm excited for that. That sounds cool. Nice. Thanks, man. Well, thank you for, thanks for hopping on, man. Thank you very much for having me, man.